Life is too short to work at a crappy company. That's why Software Engineering Daily is proud to be sponsored by Hired.com, the job marketplace for software engineers. If you accept a job through Hired, they will give you a $2,000 bonus. But as an extra bonus to our listeners, you can get an additional $2,000. That's $4,000 total if you sign up by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com and using the link on the right side of the page to sign up. Hired.com will set you up with five great companies for interviews. These are companies like Stripe, Facebook, Uber, companies you would actually want to work for, where you can go and learn the cutting edge of software engineering. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com, click on the banner on the right, and try out Hired.com. John Paul is an engineering manager and speaker and currently is the CTO at InRhythm. John, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hey, Jeff. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. So you gave a talk at React Rally, and the talk was called, Why is React Functional? And you started off the talk by teasing apart some buzzwords from the concrete ideas that are uh, associated with those buzzwords. What were you trying to accomplish with that talk? Sure. So that, that talk, so gratefully, the words functional were in air quotes. So I had a, quite a bit of liberty there. But for me, in the end, what I was trying to accomplish was, and if anyone's actually watched the whole thing, was to explain and show basically my opinion around how what makes React special and so exciting is not the virtual DOM. Like everyone right now, although this is slightly less true now, potentially even because of the talk that I gave, um, everyone is extremely hyped and excited about the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM has made its way in, in different implementations into Angular, into React, into many different, sorry, into Ember, uh, and now there are actually standalone implementations. But what makes React awesome is not the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM for me is a performance optimization that allows React to exist. Just like how if GZIP didn't exist, HTTP would never make it anywhere. But we, we are not particularly very excited every day about GZIP. But rather that React allows us to change our programming paradigm to be more functional, to allow us to think, let's, let me just change my data and not at all concern myself with how the view actually needs to render itself because of that. How does that actually change development? So typically when developing a single page web application, especially with the you know, Backbones, Embers, and Angulars, ones of the world, uh, be, having to consider that you are working within DOM the whole time and that when data changes, there needs to be um, sort of imperative code around how that data change should also impact the the DOM is is part and parcel with development in there. The Angular has watchers, uh, Ember has observers, Backbone has change listeners. All of this is so that you can write code that reacts to changes that happen in um, changes that happen in your data and then update your view because of it. React does not have any of those things. There are no uh, there are no things you have to pay attention to around when the data changes do something, when the data changes here do something else. But and, and that's a fairly salient distinction for me between the world of you know the non-React framework and the React library, which allows you to think in just just give me a render method, give me exactly how you want your DOM to look like given the data, and we'll always keep that in sync for you. So why why do people get so wrapped up in the virtual DOM? Well, at the time, and even even now, the virtual DOM is the the key performance optimization that allows a, a, a library like React to even exist. So we as so as software engineers, typically myself included, <clears throat> are sort of um, obscenely enamored with. Ex- the efficient engineering solutions to things, right? That, that's, that's why the idea of, um, you know, uh, performance, fig- figure out your performance problems later, make it work first is, is part of typical software engineering practice is because we are really excited and our mouth waters at these new technologies that are so much more efficient at whatever that thing is, at, at memory, at speed, at however, however we need to uh, uh, quantify that. So the virtual DOM 
as React gained in popularity was the really easy short buzzword that you could just use, just like how when we talk about big data, when people, what people are really excited about is not the word big data. It's all of the actual use cases and technology that the ideas around big data provide for. Virtual DOM happened to be that uh, that coalescing word that allowed everyone on different teams, products, and companies to be able to come around React and say, look, here's this thing that makes it special. Because every library and framework and and really anything that has the ability to be bandwagoned to, they, they all have uh, one central marketing term, really. Uh, and there will be a few central marketing terms. And for, for React and, and in the JavaScript community, virtual DOM happened to be that, that word that won out above all else. Though you're saying, um, you know, Angular and Ember have adopted something like the virtual DOM. Um, so, you know, what what is it that, I mean, as you've said, you know, there are, there are things that React does that are special, um, that are not necessarily the virtual DOM. Could you exemplify that by comparing React to the the newer implementations of Angular and Ember that use the virtual DOM? Why are these not as good as React? Oh, I don't know if I will say at all that they are not as good. I think oh, that okay. they do not. Uh, they they exhibit the performance, at least as much of the performance optimization that the virtual DOM provides for. Just to, just to let you know, I'm not particularly prescriptive about these things. I okay. have really enjoyed working with React. I have really enjoyed working with Ember, and I've really enjoyed working with Angular predominantly. My my life is actually typically in Angular and Ember, and 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 my day to day is not 100% React. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. For me, the the different pieces of this um, you know technology landscape are all applicable to different product and business decisions that need to be made on, sort of on a team by team basis or on a product by product basis. So I am I have no expectation, nor would this be realistic, um, that any one framework will ever win out. There is. Um, the closest we've ever gotten is sort of backbone because it was one of the first, and look where that is today. I, I'm what my opinion is is not that everyone should start working with React and, and you know migrate or dump your Ember and Angular project, but rather everyone should start playing with React because what it allows you, how it allows you to think, is so radically different from how you think about building Ember and Angular applications, that it is a worthwhile both mental challenge as well as career growth opportunity to be able to understand, oh, that's what they're talking about when they talk about functional programming. That's what they're talking about when they talk about you know, um, data or unidirectional data flow, all of these terms. Being able to understand that and use that in real code is very, um, helpful, didactic, as well as applicable to problems that you might be solving using a pro using um, a platform like you know Angular or Ember or something that's not React. So the, and, and what that, that special difference is is for me summed up in the idea of the render method. So in Ember Angular there are so Ember has uh, templates and components and many different mechanisms by which to express what DOM should be and how that DOM should be updated when the data changes. Angular has a similar amount of options. There are directives, there are templates, there are a few other things. Um, whereas in, in React, there is only one place for every you know, group of functionality where you define what your DOM should be given one state of data. And you never have to describe in that, you know, in that pocket of functionality, in that function, you never have to describe how you handle state changes. This is the key distinction for me between uh, React and basically everything else. With, with everything else, you have to, at some point in your code, think about what should my, how should I change my view when my state transitions from one place to another place? Whereas in React, all you do is think about your state transition, and React handles all of that updating for you. Right. Yeah, this is the notion that your React components describe the state of your UI at all times. Exactly. Yes, and um, that is very different. So uh, 
zooming out and like speaking of hype, um, d- do you think that React, like, are we going to look back uh, at React in in like ten years the same way that we look back on iOS today as like a, a you know just a, a game changer in terms of um, how it how it uh, changed what what people are focusing on? I mean, probably for very different reasons, but. But uh, is it, you know is it the same level of paradigm shifting technology? So okay, so I left my crystal ball at home, Jeff, and I'm very sorry about it. But I'm gonna um, I'll go out on the limb and make some guess. So <laughs> I expect so basically in the JavaScript world, we have been very very good at the plagiarism required to continue to build and grow an ecosystem. And, and when I say that, I mean that, that good ideas, gratefully, like we are, we are in software, the software industry is one that sort of is very comfortable with and glorifies taking the great ideas of others. And I'm very happy to live in a world where I can just take those great ideas and build them into my systems. So I don't know if React is going to be, I, I would guess that React, the library, potentially maybe the Facebook ecosystem around that, like Relay, GraphQL, maybe those will become, you know, Rails-y like platforms that become sort of ubiquitous in, in subsets of our community. But I can guarantee for you that the ideas in React that have already been taken to inspire libraries like Ohm in ClojureScript, libraries or libraries and languages like Elm, um, and will the, the ideas will be proliferating our minds for many years to come. And that will hopefully, and I'm, I'm very excited for the world in which our APIs are much more both fluent as well as expressive of state transitions and not the nitty gritty like React allows you to do. Um, the, the, other, the other difficulty in the question for me is that, so iOS and Apple they are based, they're a gigantic company and a business that was invested in making sure that that platform was successful. I don't know if that's exactly apples to oranges with respect to Facebook's investment in React, but the... Well, didn't they rebuild Newsfeed in React? They did. They did. But there, at least I don't know of any particular direct business interest in making sure that React becomes, you know, as ubiquitous as iOS is. Right. Okay. You know I guess I mean? there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference between internal development and, uh, and external evangelism. Exactly. Exactly. Like I, I can guarantee that there was a, you know, a budget line somewhere for marketing of iOS, you know, um, I, I, well, I although the, the the open source efforts of mm-hmm. the React team have been uh, very uh, intentional, um, completely, and, I agree, and effective, <laughs> and and effective, and mm-hmm. like that's the 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 uh, you know it's paid dividends for them, and it probably will continue to. So that's I mean that is that's certainly one uh, element of uh, yeah, evangelistic my- return. My guess would be that this is a significant hiring boom for them mm. um, and not necessarily direct to bottom line, but I mean, who, who knows what's going on in their heads. I'm pretty sure that someone, myself potentially included, could spin a way that this could make um, make them revenue directly. But I, I agree that they are immensely invested and that investment has paid off for them extremely with respect to this um, success and adoption and mindshare. But the mindshare is really what is most surprising because I was, I was actually at the JS Conf where this was, where React was announced and then subsequently significantly derided because, <laughs> oh, it's so ugly. Why are we back to using clicks? I'm throwing up in my mouth a little bit because I just wrote on click, you know, it's like those kinds of things. So it, it, they've made a significant turnaround because of that investment and, and that's uh, that's great so in in that talk why is react quote functional you uh you explored some of the differences between the server side rendering of the past and the rendering of the present um i'm not sure exactly how long you've been in web development but it's, it's you you've definitely dated yourself in that <laughs> <I did. laughs> uh, conversation so so how how have things changed 
Sure. So things have changed. Well, obviously, things have changed dramatically in that thick clients have become um, thick, thick clients. I guess what, what, what time frame are we talking about here? Is this like over the past 10 years, 15 years? Oh, I would say somewhere between 10 and 15. Yeah. I mean, think about in, in so 10 years ago, the, the websites were predominantly, you know, Java servlets or, or something like that. Rails. I don't actually know when Rails came out. But Ruby was definitely not popular. I don't know if Django or Rails were in the world then. Uh, Perl was still big and popular. Um, yeah, so I'm talking about sometime before, let's say, uh, Backbone World. So Backbone was roughly the large transition between the world of the prototypes and jQueries, where what JavaScript was doing was adding additional functionality to server rendered pages, like sometimes adding significant functionality like tooltips or wizards or charts and, and um, you know, grids, table views, tree views, all of these other things that, you know, XJS and, and the ilk happened to provide. And then there was a transition and all of what they provided was were decoration on top of server side rendered applications. And then with the advent of Backbone, which is, I should actually look this up, I'm going to guess um, 2010, I'm going to guess 2011 or 10, 2010, okay. October 13th, 2010, Backbone was initially released, just because I looked that up on Wikipedia. And that was, so I guess that that's approximately five years ago. So somewhere between five, somewhere between 10 and 15, definitely, if you want to go with dating myself, but for most of the time before Backbone, applications were rendered on the server side. That was just a standard. That was just an expectation. That's what every framework built into it, every web framework built into the system, a mechanism by which you can, when an HTTP request is received, some data is fetched from a database, data and template merge together, and large gigantic string is sent over the wire to the person's web browser where they then are able to see an HTML page. Post backbone, a lot of our, you know, investments and, and new technologies in the ecosystem move toward single page applications or thick clients such that users could have more rich user experiences typically. This was the, the, the backbone reaction was roughly, at least in my opinion, to flex because flex is what is a technology that considering the, you know, Adobe Flash ecosystem allowed you to uh, develop these really rich interactive, didn't need to wait for a full page refresh and white screen sort of um, applications. Single page web applications took that responsibility and ran with it. That's why we're able to have these amazing backbones, embers, angulars, reacts. There's a whole progression here. I don't know what will be next. Something will come after react, I'm sure. Okay. And, and you also mentioned that you, you miss, you miss refreshing the page. And you said that React brings back the feeling of refreshing a page and getting a clean slate. What do you mean by that? Sure. So, um, oh, the, now, now you're really going to make me date myself. So I loved, um, and you can get your audience can get a bit more feel of this if they see the talk. I loved the world in which I could come, I could open up my console, play around with the JavaScript in there, you know, the jQuery, the prototype, the whatever. I could. Um, add new event listeners, click on things, and completely screw up the state of the application just so that I could learn about how I should be doing something or does this actually work? Can I test this out in C2? It's just sort of the world before, you know, test-driven front-end development. Um, and then if I just, if I wanted to reset everything, if I wanted to go back to, you know, um, from scratch, clean slate, all I ever had to do was refresh the, the page. A simple command R, and I am back to a known state. I know exactly where the database is. I know where the code is because it's all written to files on disk somewhere. And I didn't have to, and I could uh, sort of get back to pristine what I had just messed up in the console to be able to debug something or test something out. What React allows, and, and because React allows you to think about applications purely as state changes, and not um, changes in view very imperatively. What that allows you to do, and that's what allows me to do, and I'm very why I find it so exciting, is that 
again, I am allowed to think, oh, I don't know. I don't have to care how I got into some weird state or how I didn't get out of some state. I get to just change my data and React automatically handles the data to view translation. So I am developing in a way that allows me to feel like everything I do is a clean slate rather than the, you know, nitty gritty of dealing with, for example, in Backbone, if I have a change listener and on that change listener, I need to, um, if the, if the item is checked, I need to do one thing to the DOM. If the item is not checked, I need to do the other thing in the DOM and I need to, you know, jQuery soup, dig around in the DOM of my element, find the right things, set the right classes, all of this really imperative, um, all this really imperative code in the jQuery world. All of that is now completely removed from me. And what I what I like liken that to is considering my application is in a clean slate all the time because I don't have to think about transitions in views. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. So so now I'll ask you, why is React functional? <laughs> so React is functional because um React's views are a pure function of the data that is passed to them. Rather than having to deal with the imperative changes that happen as an application changes through time. So um, no, no application is static. Eventually you have to put in new data, remove data. In the cruddy world, you have to you know, delete something, add something, um, make some new relationships. In the world outside of React, all of this means that you have to try to keep your data and view in sync. There's a lot of code that you are writing to keep your your view up to date when you're changing your data or your data up to date when you change stuff in your view. Now, React is functional because the view is a completely pure function of your data. So all you have to consider is change your data, React handles everything else for you. Got it. Um, so you've given some other presentations about JavaScript, and one of them is JavaScript, the bad parts. And I want to talk about this, but first, could you give me some idea of your history with JavaScript? Like, what is the arc of your relationship with the language? <laughs> um, so... This is this is interesting. I've never really thought about my relationship like this. I need to come up with some sort of timeline. So <clears throat> for me, I so I started off, you know, doing a lot of Java, uh, and from Java, very quickly made the transition into JavaScript because I really uh, enjoyed being able to work with something that I could show my parents. You know, like I could tell them, "Look, look what I'm doing. I'm making websites that you can go to when you open the blue e." Isn't that blue e beautiful? <laughs> and then you just type in this thing. So, so that for me, I mean, that was you know also HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, sort of all three together. And then as I really start to explore my own interest in programming languages, so I myself am uh, sort of a hobbyist in programming languages in general. I uh, I dilly dally in you know, Scala, Clojure. Right now it is Elm and Rust, although I have no real time to do either any justice. Um, <laughs> So as I got further into just learning the programming language JavaScript, not, I mean, very happy with the fact that I was able to use it to build websites. I really enjoyed, uh, because it was one of the fairly early ones I knew in terms of the space of dynamic programming language, uh, dynamic and weakly typed. I, I really enjoyed it because, you know, you could sort of do anything that you want and, and eventually I learned much more of the actual you know, formal semantics of things. Gratefully, there are lots of very free uh, and fairly old resources online, Douglas Crockford videos included, to be able to really dive very deep into the programming language. And I'm uh, very happy that I took that opportunity and was able to then have an understanding that that allowed me to really level up my team. And that's something I'm sort of excited to do just in my life. That's why a big part of why um, to be part of what I do here at In Rhythm is really continuously make sure that our team is learning and growing. And for me, that started off with, you know, tapping the person on the side of me, tapping the shoulder of the person on the side of me and saying, hey, uh, did you know that this is how the constructor worked in JavaScript? I had, <clears throat> I had no idea that that's how this worked. Or 
uh, hey, have you heard of object.create? This is, this is a total game changer. We don't have to write this like we, like I used to write Java anymore. Um, so I'm, my personality is one that gets really excited about these, these, uh, sort of esoteric, interesting things. At least it was esoteric in the 2008. It might not be so much so now. Um, but that, um, that allowed me to sort of grow into this finding very interesting things about a programming language, being able to put together um, presentations and then present them about how to help people learn about either technologies, programming languages, or other you know, pieces of software in general. Over Thanksgiving, I had a great idea for a web app. So instead of spending time with my family, I locked myself in a room and I started building this application using Express.js because I love full stack JavaScript. So I was testing my application locally and I was making great progress. So I decided to deploy it and share it with some of my friends and get some feedback. I used DigitalOcean. I signed up for an account using promo code SEDaily, and in 15 minutes, I had my app deployed to a server and running. It was that simple. This was really the first time I had used DigitalOcean. So if you're like me, and you like building stuff, and you have ideas for projects, give DigitalOcean a shot. It is the fastest and simplest way to deploy an application that I've ever used. If you want to give it a try, go to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SEDaily to get $10 in free credits. Check it out. So throughout that history, mm-hmm. were there any acutely painful memories with JavaScript? Like, do, Are there any particularly resonant bad experiences? Huh. So I... Let me think about this. So my experiences... I don't remember nearly as much about the bad experiences as I remember about my very um, deliberate reaction to them. So JavaScript is a frustrating language. I will give it to you. Like, especially when you start out, like the, I don't know how many times it took me to understand really how this worked um, because, you know, object-oriented JavaScript is still very popular, but at the time it was even more so because a lot of the developers were basically Java people translating everything they know to JavaScript, which is why NPM has, you know, thousands of class libraries written from before Node even existed just because they all wanted to put them up because people have been building them for so long. Um, so there are, um, so there were many frustrations around this, around hoisting, uh, I don't remember any particular like bugs. I could probably come up with that if I think about it. I, I remember there being hoisting issues where I got really frustrated because I didn't really know what the word meant, except in the context of you know cranes and. and okay, factors. so what does it mean? Um, hoisting. So hoisting is um, sort of an unintended feature of JavaScript. That excuse me, I have a blog post about. Uh, it's one of the few things that I've actually read enough of the ECMAScript specification that I have been able to write a blog post explaining from the specifications perspective mm. uh, that I'll share with you, and you might want to put into the link. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Great. Um, so what hoisting is is an accent. It, it is a word that developers use to describe a feature of the JavaScript you know, runtime interpreters that seems to move the definitions of certain variables and functions to different parts of the file than in which they seem to be written. Um, so hoisting is not actually defined in the specification. The word is the, the, the word is not used, but the reason why it matters is because Somewhere in the JavaScript specification, uh, and, and then the, my, my blog post gives you the exact number, like 15.17.1.3 or something, <laughs> it, it describes how function bodies are uh, parsed and analyzed. And in that definition, there is actually an order in which first variable declarations, uh, I, I can look this up, but I'm pretty sure it is first variable declarations are, are processed, then function declarations are processed, and then line by line, each expression, each statement is evaluated. So what that means is if you have a variable declaration at the bottom of your function, remember the order that I just described is when a function is entered, first the variable uh, declarations are analyzed, then the function declarations, then every line is executed line by line. 
What that means is even if you have a variable all the way at the bottom, it's actually processed by the JavaScript interpreter first. Mm. So this, this, this weird quirk of the spec, which does not say the word hoisting anywhere, means that when you're developing against JavaScript, it seems as if variables that you define all the way at the bottom of your file seem to already exist by the time you know, you're at the top of the file. Uh, and you can, you can test this out by looking into your you know, Chrome debugger or Firefox, whatever, whatever debugging environment you want. If you put a breakpoint at the first line, you'll see that variables that are defined all the way at the bottom are actually already there. They're just undefined until they are assigned to. Um, right. Similarly, if there are function declarations all the way at the bottom, they already appear at the top if you have a debugger at the top. So, so hoisting is this word we use to describe this surprising um, functionality of JavaScript that even though you define something at the bottom of a, fun- of a function, it already exists at the time in which you execute the first line. Sure. So uh, another of the hazards of JavaScript is prototypical inheritance. Um, mm-hmm. And you already mentioned the migration of people from Java to JavaScript and how that probably led to some strange uh, classical definitions. Um, but how, how does prototypical inheritance work in JavaScript and what are some best practices around prototypical inheritance? So, so prototypical inheritance works very, very dis- differently from classical inheritance. The, um, the, the best practices, gratefully, that apply, you know, co- favor composition over inheritance, all of the typical classical object or, um, object oriented principles, um, uh, I forget what all solid stands for. Um, single responsibility principle, interface segregation principle, um, some other ones with names. Anyway, all, almost all of the classical object oriented design um, best practices apply exactly to JavaScript, but how they are implemented more tactically is different because in prototypal inheritance, there's no such thing as a blueprint. So, so when learning about classical inheritance, uh, especially starting off, the descriptions and the analogies given are, are often along the lines of, um, I have a blueprint and then I create a real thing out of that blueprint, and then I create another real thing out of that blueprint, and these are called instances of that blueprint. But the blueprint itself is not a thing, it is just the instructions to build a thing. Now, JavaScript takes a very different approach, (laughs) which is prototypal inheritance does not itself have any blueprint, but rather you have a real thing, that real, you know, Reified, I think, is the the official programming language term for it. You have a real reified thing. And when you want to create something that inherits from it, you don't copy that. And you don't create, you know, you don't create an instance from a blueprint. But rather, you create a new thing that whenever a property is looked up on that new thing, if the new thing doesn't have it, it will go check the original object. So comparatively, in in Java, for example, there is no canonical object instance. In JavaScript, everything is about instances and nothing is about classes. This this distinction is very difficult to to begin to approach as a Java developer, for example, or as someone who's very used to uh, the using of the new keyword to mean one thing, whereas in JavaScript it means something very, very different. Um, prototypal inheritance gratefully now is often wrapped up in libraries like um, Backbone, Extend, and, and you know, Ember now has its, uh, its, its own object-oriented extension mechanism, and almost every library has their own. Uh, ES6 now standardizes a lot of that with the addition of class syntax, which while does work exactly the same as prototypal inheritance in JavaScript in ES5, it provides the syntax that everyone is accustomed to from the Java C Sharp world, um, and I'm very I'm excited about how that will potentially bring in even more people to enjoy this language. Could potentially cause some confusion when they when they realize that new does not do at all what it does in other languages. Um, but 
Yeah, so that, that's in, in a nutshell, if that was at all anything close to a nutshell, that is how prototypical <laughs> inheritance works. It's a large nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, so are there any other bad aspects of JavaScript that, uh, that you outline in JavaScript, the bad parts? Sure. So my, my talk, uh, JavaScript, the bad parts, was not specifically around what is what I consider to be bad parts of the programming language, but rather what is very difficult to teach. So what I considered bad was not, so the, there is a list actually in the back of um, Douglas Crockford's book, JavaScript, the, bad, the Good Parts. There is an appendix at the end of that, um, at the end of that book. And in that appendix, he talks about JavaScript, the bad parts. Um, and he gives examples of particularly catchy, sorry, particularly uh, snaring issues that, that could come up with things like void and eval, uh, the with statement. Um, and my sort of thesis statement in the talk, uh, or my point of conflict or whatever, is that while I agree that the things that Douglas Crawford had in that book are not, you know, the best from a language design or ease of use perspective, realistically, when was the last time any developer had a, had a issue with the with keyword? <laughs> how many with how many with bugs have you had? How or many eval. Void, yeah, how many yeah or eval? How many void bugs have you had lately? I, I have very few. Um, and for library maintainers, for for like people who are building libraries or people who are maintaining very old libraries, maybe I could see that these are the things that you'd have to both uh, understand very well, which I think is useful, as well as make sure you know the pitfalls of. But for me, the bad parts of JavaScript are not the things that you might be ensnared by, but rather, what are the parts of JavaScript that are actually very difficult to understand? Mm. Like, what, are the, what are the parts that require a high, what I call, high blog post to understanding ratio? Right? <laughs> like, like, I can pretty easily, like, if, if I want to learn about how Booleans work in JavaScript, my blog post to understanding ratio is approximately one. Like I, I can get that pretty quickly. If I want yeah. to understand how NAN works in JavaScript, <laughs> my blog post to understanding ratio is maybe a hundred. Like I mean, maybe now I sort of understand it, but uh, NAN or the this uh, keyword or how uh, prototypal inheritance works, um, there all of these how the scope and hoisting work. What is the difference between a function declaration and a function expression? These are the things that are obnoxiously complicated to learn when you are starting out with JavaScript. They are not like Boolean strings or, or even pure functions. Like the, the idea of a, um, the idea of an anonymous function doesn't exist in Java, but someone who with a Java background can understand, I guess it does exist in Java now. I'm talking about Java 5 from my dating myself times. Um, it's pretty straightforward for someone from that background to understand this concept in JavaScript called a function. Whereas explaining how this works in a class in JavaScript could take someone, you know, a dozen blog posts, six months of asking their friends on, on IRC or Stack Overflow, and then like three weeks later, and then it finally clicks. And they finally say, oh, I get it now. And so th that's what my, my what, that's what that talk was about. It was about the, the parts that are very difficult to understand. Sure. Okay. So, uh, zooming out back into the uh, the larger web development ecosystem, you mentioned that you've been playing with Elm. Um, we had we recorded an, an episode with Elm uh, about Elm recently. I don't know. I found it to be a uh, fascinating language and um, just makes kind of a lot of uh, ambitious breakthroughs. So, uh, what what is your experience with Elm and um, and where do you think it's going? What do you think it represents about the future of web development? Hmm. So I, in terms of the future of web development, I think that the, uh, the most, uh, the safest answer is that we are moving toward functional constructs as a expectation in libraries instead of just an added, you know, helpful afterthought. Like um, prototype, for example, map, filter, all of the, all of the, 
all of the array methods that the prototype library added, that was one small piece of the entire prototype library. <clears throat> Whereas now we're sort of expecting these ideas to permeate frameworks and, and in the case of Elm, entire programming languages and platforms for developing products. Like Elm, Elm is not just a programming language that turns files to JavaScript. It's actually, I, I don't even know if it's their intent to ever do that by itself. But Elm is, uh, you know, Elm is a, you know, a platform to build web applications using this programming language. And that's uh, sort of going along with the functional programming that is a game changer right now. I think that those ideas will similarly to React continue along the everything we do from now on will continue to be inspired by these kinds of ideas. Right. Sure, it makes a lot of sense. So you're CTO at a company called InRhythm. What yes. is InRhythm? So InRhythm is a is a JavaScript consultancy. We um, we focus on you know bringing in really solid engineers, so, you know junior through senior, building along with our teams in enterprise. So we focus on helping enterprises group, like build modern front end software engineering stacks. We do a lot of mean development, so um, Mongo, Express, Node, and Angular. Although that's just now our, some of our React projects are growing as well, and you know, things like that can always change. Gratefully, with in rhythm, we're always doing really greenfield development, so we're always keeping up with what the newest thing out there and the thing mm -hmm. that most of our clients will want to be working with. We're then able to learn them very quickly because of my you know, focus on training and growing as a sort of program here at InRhythm. And then going out to our clients and being able to be really effective building building products for them. What are the challenges of working with large organizations? Hmm. So that is so that very it's they're very distinct between um, working as a consultancy that's partnering with them to achieve a goal or you know working as an employee. In general, though, I'll say that especially for yeah, from from your point of view, from <laughs> sure. from the point of view of a consultancy that's creating applications for these large corporations, like um, I'm trying to think of an example from uh, the companies that you've worked with, but you've worked with a lot of gigantic companies, Goldman yes. Sachs. <laughs> yes, yes, we've worked there's, there. There are lots of logos. There are lots of logos on that. <laughs> um, so the the challenges aren't that the, the most salient challenge for someone with, um, you know, our individual developers or someone with um, the engineering background, like I'm a, I'm a programmer as well as, you know, CTO of this of the company. And the, the most salient one is bureaucracy is fairly antithetical to our lives, like to our lives, our mindset. So, so dealing with and navigating the, and I don't say bureaucracy is a bad thing. Bureaucracy is a necessary part of you know, large organizations. It's, the, the, it's a big part of why many of these organizations are very effective. But that, that, that is probably the largest, understanding the landscape of large companies is probably the most difficult and surprising for my team to, because it's very different per company. Every company has their own culture. Every company has their own uh, ways of doing things within that bureaucracy. So, so finding ways to learn that very quickly is, is high high priority for me and my tech leads, basically. Uh, but that, that, that's the most salient one. So you mentioned that you're building a lot of greenfield applications for these mm -hmm. companies. Um, I, I'm curious, like, are these are the applications that you write for these big companies, are they typically, like, replacing old applications that these companies have? Um, in certain situations, yes. Um, I would say that we are, I don't know if that's, that's, that is probably not the majority of it, but in, in certain cases it is. Basically, we are, um, as any product development consultancy, we are the go-to people to be building modern and maintainable software. And for, for each of our clients, the reason why we've been so successful is to be able to um, build something from Greenfield that we are, because so we are, we're sort of run by reputation, gratefully, here in New York. So we need to be, we're not the typical consultants that go in, hack some stuff together, and just throw it over to your team to release it. Because 
we need that reputation where someone for where an engineer from that next team. So we, we hand off with a, you know, uh, a learning period to make sure that we are bringing that team up to speed. And we want to make sure that every time that team um, looks at this code, they don't say, oh, well, how the, how the hell does this get written? <laughs> but rather, but rather, oh, I see the patterns we should follow. This is not a broken window sort of situation. We've laid that groundwork for them to take that for the distance. So because of that, we are able to really quickly iterate on these modern bleeding edge greenfield thing. And that's what we've become known for, to be able to lay that foundation so solidly that internal teams can then move on from there and be continually effective. How, how has the world of consulting changed uh, in with kind of with the advent of Web 2.0? Like, have there been any major changes, whether through mobile or uh, through through the uh, you know the the emphasis on the newer newer emphasis on JavaScript, um, what's changed in a more modern context? So I mean, so to be honest, I'm not that uh, I am not an extremely veteran person within consultancies. Um, so my my background does come from the product side. I've worked at uh, Condé Nast and other media companies. Um, so I'll give you my sort of assumptions around that. What sure. <laughs> What uh, the, the web development industry as a whole has always been very it, it, well. It's been growing extremely. Regardless of our worries around mobile, it is still a, a gigantic industry that is providing huge amounts of jobs. What we've been able to do here at In Rhythm is really package up the best practices around a niche within web development around, you know, modern front-end software engineering focusing on test-driven development and maintainability. And and what the – and gratefully, this is consistently – as software gets more ingrained in our lives and, in a certain sense, more complicated, there are always more of these opportunities. Like there uh, – five years ago, the, the idea of a second screen didn't really exist, right? Pre, Pre-iPad, well, there, there was no such thing. The, the idea of a watch that integrates with, you know, some TV show that you're watching is also a new idea. We, we're, we're in a, we're in a fairly prolonged stage economically of very, very fast and new growth. And for us as a consultancy, gratefully, we are in a situation where we can continue to keep up with that because our focus is on, um, building new solid software. Uh, solid in both senses of the world, the word, I suppose. So I, I think it's, it's been very, it's been very helpful with respect to the industry's growth. But outside of that, I mean, I'd love, I'd love to talk to you again in maybe a year or two, and <laughs> see, uh, I see a little bit more clear picture of what the sure. industry is is like outside of you know. So, so and as CTO, uh, I imagine you're involved in a lot of hiring, and I'm curious, like from the hiring perspective, how do you see? these uh, new coding boot camps? How do you see the new glut of, of types of programmers and how do they compare to the more typical uh, types of people who, who, have, who come from like a computer science background? I don't know if I would call it a glut. Um, really? But, yeah, at least not yet. Um, the, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think currently the, basically we are in a situation where Junior programmers with practical experience, not zero, but not very high, are, um, I don't know, what, I don't want to say ubiquitous, but I want to say significantly more uh, frequently come across than, you know, maybe five years ago. Um, and what that is, and, and there, there's sort of a stratification of different schools with respect to practical, accessible knowledge and um instead of, you know, book knowledge a little bit. And what I, I'm actually very excited about how that will continue to grow. Listen, I'm very um, uh, optimistic about how the industry will grow, uh, tech bubble questions aside, and how making sure that we continually have that pipeline. So, so at InRhythm, what I focus on with respect to hiring is making sure that we are able to hire 
at all levels across the spectrum. Like there are, there are lots of senior people at the company that I've been very excited to work with and learn from, but there are also people that are starting out. And what boot camps provide for are not people that are um, typically immediately practically implementable, but rather people who are very quickly coachable very quickly um, mentorable to put them into to a situation where they might be able to help your, uh, so we are an agile shop, we are scrum, and we have story points and all of those things. So, so I'm going to use some of those words. It's not like any one person is going to double your velocity in any one given week, but rather being able to pair a senior person and a junior person for some time, or be able to put someone just out of a coding boot camp into a team where they are mentored by many people who are much more who are more or much more senior than them can in in can very quickly bring someone who is, you know, I made a I made two side projects on GitHub and I finished a coding boot camp into someone that is, you know, giving their first talk at a meetup. Or into someone that is, oh, I just read a book, I just finished uh, Pragmatic Programmer, and I want to write a blog post about it. Or um, I just learned about how JavaScript is horrible. I want to talk to you about how horrible JavaScript is, for example. Um, and and the, that's sort of the transition that I like to create in my teams, and that I like to make sure that the organization is supporting. Well, what's the software engineering ethos of New York like or, or do you think you could can you even categorize uh, cities by their the way that software engineering takes I, place in those cities I do think that you can and I do think that I will attempt to right now so <clears throat> I guess it's hard to do this without comparing and contrasting then please compare and contrast <laughs> so New York from my perspective is very or it's on the low end of what I call hacker culture, like what what I would I think more more titles in Silicon Valley have the word hacker in them compared to here where compared to here in New York. I actually don't know where you were from, Jeff. Uh, I'm from Austin originally. I'm in Seattle right now. Ah, okay, got it, got it. Um, so Seattle nor Austin do I know that much about. I know a little bit about Austin, but. Uh, New York titles, for example, it's fairly rare to see hacker in a title. It is much more likely to see programmer or software engineer or developer. And for me, that cultural distinction is around, um, I'm, I'm not at all saying this negatively, but it is the, the professionalism that is sort of required within the New York culture that is not as prevalent uh, outside of New York. New York is very focused on that, making sure that, and that's a big part of why uh, I'm very happy at in rhythm, seeing in rhythm success in that, making sure that we have maintainable, um, testable, tested software is a big piece of that instead of the culture that, that does exist in New York, but I do not think is nearly as prevalent as other areas of let's just make this, let's just get this stuff out. Let's just make this and finish it and get it done. And, and of course, there's always that balance there with respect to quality. But uh, so I've run I run a meetup in New York uh, called NYC HTML5. Um, the words HTML5 are not quite as you know cool as they were in 2000. And, and I keep dating myself. This is only like 2011 or something like that. It wasn't that long ago when the meetup was created. But it's basically become the you know interesting stuff in a browser meetup. <clears throat> we we do some talks on Node, some talks on things that are unrelated to HTML5 officially. And almost, let's say, 30% of my talks have been about testing. Hmm. Quite, quite accidentally, not because I have intended to be, to be, and now I would say within the past six months to a year, half of them have been about React. So it's not like I'm going to, I can't necessarily statistically extrapolate some um, significant information out of this. But heuristically, I feel like that the, the culture is focused much more on um, you know, software engineering best practices. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I could see that. So, I mean, let's talk more about that, that HTML5 meetup. I've done a lot of shows about JavaScript, um, but not too many about HTML5. And I know you said the focus of the, of the, of the meetups have, have, you know, shifted away from solely HTML5, but, but, um, you know what is what is important in the world of HTML right now? What is changing? 
Hmm, that's a good question that I do not know if I have the a good answer to. Like I, as far I have not heard of anything really new. All I have heard is the completion or the additions of, of features to existing specs. For example, the get user media get user media has been around since what 2011, 2012. But certain pieces of it have not been implemented until recently, like the Media Recorder API. That's been specified for a while, but it doesn't exist in, in Firefox and IE yet. Uh, then, for example, Shadow DOM, um, which is part of the HTML5 you know, suite of specifications under Web Components, is um, was just implemented in Chrome, I think, today, or it was just released into Chromium uh, Canary or something recently. So the the landscape is changing because the implementations are starting to catch up to where the specs were which is sort of in some situations very backwards to other parts of web development where you know browsers are people are polyfilling every which way and browsers need to figure it out afterward but i don't believe there have been any new um new dom apis html apis um outside of you know ecmascript 6 and ecmascript uh, i guess 2016 uh recently Mm. Very interesting. Um, well, you know, to begin to close off, what do you see as the next evolution of web applications? Like, where are we going? Hmm. Neural implants. <laughs> They're going right into your head. Um, I know. So, so web development has can, right now the sort of next direction although it's been true for you know a few years now, is mobile. But finding ways for mobile to be a much more uh, seamless experience has been a focus, but not yet really implemented. For example, Service Worker. So Service Worker is an, a new specification that's now being actually implemented. I think in uh, Chrome for Android has support for it now where a lot more native app-like functionality is possible with it, as well as offline mode and caching and things like that. So I think that even though I don't necessarily think that this is the be-all, end-all of web development, I do think that the upcoming years will be focused on meeting the needs of the mobile phone user, not necessarily matching the native APIs or anything like that. And, And I'm very... I'm very happy with that as a mobile phone user, being able to think about a world in which, you know, offline is straightforward and easy and I can use, um, I don't know, I can use Yelp without having to come out of a, uh, come out, out of the subway or something like that. Um, a lot of my offline desires, by the way, are because I live in New York where I use the subway and it's very, it's often very frustrating for me when I have to, um, switch cellular on and off some, in some particular subway station because I know that for 17 feet between this stairwell and that stairwell, I can get the internet connection. Um, so yeah, so, so web development in general, I would say continuing down the mobile path and new things will come. New things always come. The only, uh, the only constant is uh, death, taxes, and change. Um, <sighs> and, and I'm excited to see where the, the rapids take us but I don't particularly have any futurist sort of predictions around where it will be other than okay. you know, the, the, neural, the neural implant one day. I <laughs> got it. Well, John Paul, thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. It's been really interesting talking to you. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. It was uh, very awesome. exciting. <laughs>